Today's a big day. So welcome to Horizon Unitarian Universalist Church. My name is Lisa Casto. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I serve as the president of the Board of Trustees. On behalf of the members and staff of our church, I welcome you into this space as we celebrate our shared ministry with the installation of the Reverend Chris Rothbauer as our third settled minister. We are excited to welcome you to our worship service this afternoon. We're really, really glad to have you here with us today, whether you're joining us in person or virtually, whether you're here for the first time or whether you've been here for longer than you can remember. Here at Horizon, we welcome people of all faiths and of no faith in particular. Whoever you are, whomever you love, you are, wherever you are on your journey, you're welcome among us. If there's anything we can do to make your experience in this space more comfortable, please, please don't hesitate to let me or one of the greeters know. As the service begins, please remember to set your cell phones and other electronic devices to silent or turn them off. Following the service this afternoon, you're invited to an informal reception in the fellowship hall. folks. It is time. If you could rise in body and spirit or spirit and join us in singing our processional hymn, Wake Now My Spirit, number 298 in the gray hymnal, and the words will be projected on the screen.
nominee for best installing church of a third new minister in Carrollton, Texas on West Hebron Parkway on March 10th, 2024. And the winner is Horizon! Wake now, friends, to ministry clear and bright, a ministry that can serve the spiritual hopes of this community, the needs of this community, the vision of God's reclamation of the human heart. Wake to this moment, this day, this world that calls us to open our eyes and ears and to the hope that moments like this will enliven us to see the good we can do and be. Wake to the call to celebration of what is possible in the ministry and also to the real and dangerous hopes you are pinning on Chris right now. <laughs> Knowing Chris is here to serve, not save you, to love you into being and hold this community in a gentle and fierce joy. Wake to this moment, friends, clear and bright. The horizon, got me, is calling us to wake and know God's love embraces the whole human race. And let the people say amen. Amen. That's my part. <laughs> Join me in lighting the chalice, the symbol of our faith. 
in the twinkling of an eye, lost in the cloud of haze and dreams. May our chalice be a symbol that we will be there. May it be a symbol guiding our path as we journey far, as we journey wide. May it be a symbol and a beacon calling us back when we've journeyed too far, losing our way, shaking, crying, crashing to the ground. May it be a symbol that reminds us that we are not alone, that we, a people, will call each other home as we open the doors wider and wider, calling those home who don't know yet that they need our home. Beloveds, may it be a symbol, a sacred symbol of your love your faith, and your everlasting commitment. Our chalice is lit. Good afternoon. Hey friends. Uh, I am not, as it turns out, Jessica York, the Director of Congregational Life. It may say that in some of your orders of service. Uh, Jessica had a family emergency yesterday and was unable to attend. And as always, I am delighted to be here. Uh, instead, you have me. My name is Natalie Briscoe. My pronouns are she, her, and I am the lead for the Southern Region of your Unitarian Universalist Association. It is such a pleasure and an honor to be with you here on this occasion, the installation of Reverend Chris Rothbauer. Just as an individual joins a congregation to amplify their values in the world, so do congregations join their association to be in larger conversation about the co-creation of Unitarian Universalism itself. Congregations in our association are sovereign governing bodies unto themselves and enter into a covenantal relationship with each other to bring more love, more hope, more justice, and more joy into this world. It is that association that employs me and I am a symbol of the covenant between you and other congregations, charged with the task of going between and among you so that you may see yourselves and feel the bonds that connect you to each other. It is in this spirit that I join you today, and I hope that whenever you see me, you see all of your sibling congregations throughout Texas, throughout the South, throughout the United States, and throughout the world. Another manifestation of the covenants that bind you to each other is our General Assembly, which happens at the end of June, and this year is virtual and quite easy to participate in. So I recommend, I invite you enthusiastically to join us at our General Assembly, our largest gathering of Unitarian Universalists throughout the year, um, to talk about that co-creation of Unitarian Universalism. And finally, a third manifestation of the covenant between you and your other sibling congregations is the Annual Program Fund, or APF for short. Your generosity horizon and commitment to living into the promise of love that Unitarian Universalism has offered has designated you an honor congregation, and I offer profound gratitude and celebration for you for that. Well, Reverend Chris, as I'm sure you've gleaned by now, Texas is, as they say, sort of another country. <laughs> it has its own values and culture and ways of being, and serving and leading in Texas means understanding that we you use live in the balance between loving our Texas culture 
and simultaneously transforming it into the beloved community that we see. There is more overlap in that than you would originally think. I always say that the reason that I choose to live in Texas is because it's the right mix of, of BS that's changeable <laughs> and an affordable lifestyle. <laughs> but more than that for me, Texas is my home. I grew up here, I came of age here, I graduated three degrees here, I've sat 72 hours on the floor of the Capitol building and I've marched in every pride parade in the, in, in the cities. Texas has grown me and loved me and helped me become a better person through the experience of grace. And these folks at Horizon, they are home too. I served here for a decade learning to be a leader, a professional, and frankly, a grown-up. <laughs> Horizon has also grown me and loved me and helped me be a better person through the experience of grace. My hope for you, Reverend Chris, is that you also get to experience Texas and Horizon as home in this way. And my hope for you, Horizon, is that you grow and love and give Reverend Chris the grace in the only way that I know you know how, with great abundance. Sometimes when a minister is called and installed as the lead or solo or senior minister, it can feel pretty lonely. It can feel like a lot falls on your shoulders, like you are suddenly the expert, the sole expert for hundreds of people, and you have to know it all, all the time. As you take on this new role, Reverend Chris, I hope you know how very not alone you are. I extend to you today not just greetings from the U's throughout the South and the US and the world, but also greetings of our distinct partnership in the success of your ministry and the ministry of this congregation. I hope you feel held, and I hope you feel loved, and I hope you feel celebrated. And it is indeed with great joy that I say congratulations to you, Reverend Chris, and to you, Horizon, on this wonderful beginning of a new ministry. Welcome home. Good afternoon, y'all. <laughs> I represent and bring greetings from the congregations of North Texas, all of them where we have been celebrating Unitarian Universalism and liberal religion in North Texas for more than a century. We've had a congregation here for 125 years, but the Universalists were here before that, much more. And I've heard they were here in the 1840s, saving people even then. We continue forth that tradition. So I welcome you and give congratulations and Best wishes for many more years of congregation life. May we be so. Good afternoon. My name is Sarah Burrell Harab. I am the intern minister for the Texas Unitarian Universalist Justice Ministry. And I am a member of Horizon, and I am... <laughs> I am so overjoyed to bring Reverend Chris and Horizon greetings on behalf of the Texas Unitarian Universalist Justice Ministry, uh, which we affectionately call Texudum. <laughs> Now, Horizon is a member of Texujum, along with approximately 40 other congregations in Texas. And our, um, we are the, the Texas State Action Network, and the way that we serve our member congregations is we provide opportunities to collaborate together and with interfaith and justice partners to show power, to build power with each other and to show 
to raise our values in the public square, and in this way, to collectively bend Texas towards justice, towards communities of care that we don't even know what they look like yet, but communities of care that center those that are the most impacted by racism, by classism, by all of the, of the oppressions that get in the way of each and every individual in Texas and the environment thriving. And what I know about Horizon is that Horizon shows up. Horizon shows up for beloved community. Horizon shows up filled with compassion. Horizon shows up for a just world. And what I know about showing up in this work is that it requires roots, spiritual grounding, knowing who we are and what we treasure. It requires a place to go to get your well refilled, because this is not easy work. It requires pushing the moral imagination, breaking it open into a world that is yet to be, that we don't even know what it is. And what I know about Reverend Chris is that they are aware of this. Reverend Chris, through dream work, can help us push the moral imagination. Reverend Chris is aware of spiritual hunger and the ways that they can provide sustenance. Reverend Chris can lead us in providing that sustenance for each other so that we're continually changing, growing, and being out there creating beloved community with our every interaction. And so congratulations, Horizon. Congratulations, Reverend Chris. And I am overjoyed and thrilled about what we can be together. Greetings once again. My name is Phoenix Bell Shelton Beggs, and I have the honor and privilege of serving as a member of the Executive Leadership Council for Trust, Transgender, Religious, Unitarian, Universalist Professionals Together. There was a time in our denomination, in our movement, where there were zero trans religious professionals out living their lives. There was a time when there were two, and then five, and 10, 25, and 40. Today, there are over 150 trans and non-binary UU religious professionals So I send you greetings from trust on behalf of those religious professionals who too often find themselves in congregations that say that they are ready to have a trans minister, that say that they are ready to embrace pronouns, that say that they understand the intersections of non-binary identities, that then within three years, kick their minister to the curb. So Horizon, my charge to you, on behalf of trust, on behalf of all of our ministers who have been removed in negotiated resignations from their congregations for being who they are, is don't do that to Reverend Chris. <laughs> I know your address, and I will share your address. <laughs> So be the love that I know you can be. Continue to be that congregation that when people act up, 
members of your board wear kilts to show that you are in support, that you understand. You will make mistakes along the way. And as a non-binary person, I expect you to. For the truth is, we do too. Make the mistake, do it in love, learn from it, and continue showing up and showing out when it is needed. So again, I send you greetings from Trust and from all of the trans, non-binary, religious professionals, including those who are no longer among us and those who will join us because of the work that you are doing right here. My name is Danielle Schroyer, and uh, I offer warm greetings today on behalf of the Hayden Institute, where Chris is soon to graduate from our two-year DreamWork program, which already got mentioned, I'm happy to say. Um, the Hayden Institute was founded in 1994 as a community of learners engaged in practicing and learning the transformational gifts of wisdom, spirituality, and Jungian psychology. So we have both a spiritual direction and a dream work school, as well as a summer dream conference. And the most important thing th that we teach is that spiritual maturity and psychological individuation, growing up, basically, um, is, can, can only be done through deep inner work. We learn to do this work ourselves so that we can help others do this work. And our goal is for each person that's touched by this, these teachings would take these gifts into the world um, as a hope of healing and transformation, bringing greater compassion and wholeness to communities and to the people that we're in relationship with. So I've had the privilege of serving as Chris's dream work mentor for nearly two years now, and they have been such a valuable and joyful presence in our cohort. Chris brings warmth and insight, compassion, awareness, and curiosity to all that they do. And it has strengthened our cohort so much to have Chris among us. Um, being a mentor means that not only have I gotten to hear Reverend Chris's dreams a lot over the past handful of years, um, but that I've also gotten to read their reflections on many books and topics as we've traveled through all of these teachings and learnings. And I'm always blessed by what Reverend Chris has to say and share about their learnings. Um, when we heard that your congregation here at Horizon had called Reverend Chris, we as an entire cohort said how lucky they are to have you. And I hope that you know that that's true. We hope you know that Chris is such a special person and my prayer is that you can be a gift to each other in your time together here. That the work that you do together may be a gift and a balm to this world that much, much needs it. So on behalf of the Hayden Institute and our cohort, particularly many of whom are online today, congratulations, Chris. We are so excited for you. And personally for me, because I'm in Dallas, I'm so happy to have Chris here with me. Um, I'd like to say the first thing I did was take them to get tacos, and I feel like that was a good move. <laughs> I was like, Torchies, we're going to start with Torchies. Um, so more of that in the future for me, certainly. We're so glad to have you part of the Texas community. Um, and best wishes to all of you at Horizon UU as you journey forward together.
you come up a little closer? You, there's some seats over here. I would really like you to come up close so I have somebody to tell a story to. So, to, oh, thank you. Oh, my goodness. Yes, the young and the young at heart, as we say here at Horizon. This is wonderful. Well, I have a story for you all today. It's, I call it the river, but it's really based on a book called Bear Came Along. And that book is by Richard T. Harris, and the illustrations are by Llewellyn Fong. And so I'm going to go ahead and tell you a story. And folks, make sure you can see, because I do need my notes over here. So this might be blocking your view. So feel free to come on up. So let's start the story. Okay. As you can see, once there was a river, and the river flowed day and night. And it was like many rivers. It had eddies, that means slow parts. And then it had rapids, you know, really, really fast water, right? And then it also had smooth sections and it had rocky sections. And also, it had many twists and turns and you couldn't see them until you were like right on top of them, okay? So you get the picture? And also, as the river flowed, it took many, many things with it. Things like, you know, fallen leaves, fish and frogs, and then things like this, logs. Yeah, there we go. Do you all see the log? Can you see? <sighs> so anyway, the river didn't know it was a river until Bear, Bear came along. So let's go ahead and put Bear in its place. There we go. So Bear didn't really know what he was getting into. He was just being curious, and when he got into the river, he started going on the log. There were lots of waves and things like that, and he didn't know what the river could do. But he didn't know what he was on an adventure until Frog came along. Now, Frog was lonely, and Frog was looking for some friends. Yeah, it's a frog. Yes, it is. So Frog didn't know how many friends she really had until the turtles came about. Now, as you can tell, yeah, the turtles were, how, do you think these were happy turtles? No, they were worry warts. They were so worried about what was behind the bend, what was going to happen in the future. 
and they were warning everybody about the rough water, and they were, I don't know, kind of worried about everything, and, but they didn't know that they were on an adventure until Beaver appeared. <laughs> Beaver, as you can tell, was a natural board leader, definitely a captain. <laughs> Hopped on that log and got right to the front. There she is. And she took them on their way. And the thing is, though, is that Beaver wasn't really sure. I mean, she knew where she was going, but she didn't know how to handle like all the rapids and all the detours. But then the raccoon showed up. <laughs> So the raccoons, let's see if I can get raccoon one in there. Here's raccoon two. <laughs> yes. Well, anyway, the raccoons were happy-go-lucky folks. They loved excitement. They lived for the rapids and things like that. And the thing is, though, is that the raccoons didn't really, weren't very careful. And until Duck showed up. Now, Duck was living in her own world. She was just happily paddling along. She had no idea that a log full of animals was just about to run into her. And that's what happened, is that they ran into her. So they were going along, and they, were, they came around a bend, and guess what was around the corner? Guess what was around the curve? Can you guess? A waterfall, that's right. So, for a moment, the animals, they stood still on the edge of the waterfall. And th what do you think happened after that? Yes, they dropped. They started sliding down the waterfall, like in slow motion. And as they fell, the log went one place, and the animals went other places. But guess what happened after that? Just guess. What do you think happened? They all washed away. Oh, well, close. <laughs> guess what? They held on to each other. So Bear held on to Frog, and Frog held on to the turtles. You know, frogs have two arms and two legs, yeah. right? So they held on to the turtles. <laughs> and then the turtles, they held on to the beaver, and then the beaver held on to the raccoons, and the raccoons held on to the duck. And they went down, 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 and then what do you think happened? No, no. <laughs> guess what? I know it's a good guess, but no, you know what happened? They landed with a big splash. And they and it was so it was exciting and they said, "Oh, what a ride." So, we have so many animals living together with different personalities, different skills, different strengths, living their separate lives, but they didn't know they were in it together. They didn't know until the river came along. So thank you, friends. Thank you for being such great listeners. And now we're going to have you go back to childcare. Thank you so much for participating. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Reverend Misha Sanders. I am so honored to uh, be here, and I am... Um, happily uh, the minister at our UU congregation in beautiful Sandy Springs, Georgia. I bring you greetings from my people. Um, whew, take a deep breath with me, all. This has been a beautiful, great day already. I am full, my heart is full already of impossible dreams that are impossible until they aren't, just like this beautiful day. Would you take a moment with me for a little bit of prayer and meditation? however that works for you. Great spirit of love, I'm not going to close my eyes when I pray to you today because I prefer to look you straight in your face. Great spirit of love, I'm not going to invoke you from somewhere out there because like I just said, I'm looking at you. Here you are. Thank you. 
Thank you, Spirit of Love, for being here today, for bringing us all together on this day. Thank you so much for the magic that you are creating in the world. I am not invoking the power of love because I'm a great and powerful invoker of great and powerful things, but it's because I'm looking straight at you that I know that you are here and I know that you are powerful enough to create impossible dreams, to make a way where there is no way. You've done it before. You're fixing to do it again. Chris, love surrounds you. Love surrounds you, you know how I know that? Well, because I'm looking at it right in the face. Love will guide you, love will hold you. We ask that in your name, great power of love. Thanks for letting me look you straight in the face. Would you hold your hands over your hearts for just a moment? I'm not gonna ask you to touch each other or, or say anything, but maybe just look around and look into the face of the great love. That's it, that's the whole prayer. <laughs> well, amen. <laughs> <laughs> and in the spirit of love, our reading for today is Unsentimental Love by M. Jade Kaiser from Enfleshed. May the love I am learning to practice not be so sentimental that it appears to lack direction. This love is moving with purpose, not toward a transcendent unity of rising above, nor a God of come together, but down into the depths of everything, where power, pain, and possibility push and pull us toward or away from transformation. May there be no confusion that what I mean to say and do is love according to principles that set free. Literally, learning to love in the direction of abolition. And also learning from love that unbinds those deep down parts that cling fearfully to what deadens and destroys. May the love I am learning to practice be tender, yes, but also unafraid to bite. May the sharp teeth of its determination cut through every layer and legacy of all that has been done and undone in its name and fiercely declare its truth. Oh, beloveds, what a sacred day. What a sacred day, what joy, what love, what immense possibility. This afternoon, we bear witness to the promise that is renewed between and among you. I can feel it in this hall. Can you feel it? Yeah. On this glorious day through celebration and praise, via the joyous welcome of the Reverend Chris Rothbauer into a new shared ministry with this cherished community. We remind ourselves of the forward-facing love of our witness and our collective callings. Today, we return to the foundations of this congregation and reclaim for ourselves the promise of beloved community. And we commit once again to the sacred covenant that calls us to welcome radically, love boldly, grow spiritually, and serve courageously together. Today, we name ourselves and each other and all those whose lives are touched by this community. Beloved. You see, there are so many kinds of successful shared ministries. We never talk about that, really. What is the texture of success, right? Ones that truly draw 
on the best of both minister and congregation, including staff and old friends and those dedicated souls who established community long before we arrived. And I know some of you are actually in this hall. Thank you for that work. And still within all that possibility, there is this particular kind of pairing one where the best of all who come together to shape and build community do so in ways that truly invite us to make ourselves better than we were. Not perfect loves better than we were. Where the container we build for congregational life sets love free to become what love truly is, a practiced love, a love that unbinds, a love even at times with teeth. One that holds us accountable to our core values in the world. And we need those ministries. We need faithful communities because in this moment in history, when we are all of us wrapped up in the struggles of our nation to understand its values and its commitments amongst disagreement and strife, we need congregations doing the faithful and difficult work of holding fast to other ways of being in the world. We need all those who will love the sacred wholeness of all who are targeted or made small in this fearful and fearing time. We need those who will re-infuse us with joy, with beauty, that we might remember how best to live. And we need those who understand our full humanity, even when we fail, and we will, I do, right? Who encourages us to compassion for ourselves as we try again. And so I'm here this afternoon to bear witness to my faith in your capacity to embody the all-embracing love that we inherit from our universalist tradition. Our reading this afternoon came from the Reverend M. Jade Kaiser, who is the co-founder and co-director of Enfleshed. I love Enfleshed. They say that they were created out of a longing for collective liberation and engagement with the sacred through collective, liberative, creative, and nourishing practices and ideas unencumbered by dogma, religious respectability politics, or denominational ties. Enfleshed works to center those whose spiritual wisdom goes too often overlooked due to identity, due to conservatism, or control. And into this creative matrix of possibility, Reverend Kaiser offers us a reminder that the love which lives at the center of our faith, which buoys our congregations and communities and calls us to our greater selves comes with a determined expectation that we will do the work of transformation, right? They insist on a love that sets us free, whose principles work tirelessly to release us and to liberate the world from all that deadens and destroys. The name enfleshed is not an accident. In these days when so very much of what we value and hold dear is debated in the public square, I want to invite you to consider the wisdom you inherit from this and other communities. Where are the places in your life or in the lives of the beloveds close to your heart where others seek to make us less than we are? What are the situations where you show up in small everyday moments or in grand organizing events just to make sure there is room enough for someone else to live? Who are you encouraging to love their own flesh? One of my mentors, the Reverend Dr. Emily Towns, is an American Baptist clergywoman and a renowned womanist ethicist who I experience most as living what I call her universalist heart wide open. She lives her faithful witness that every one of us is utterly and completely embraced by a love that is larger than our own knowing, that we could never earn on our own, that we are held by a love that abides. 
Our most basic teaching is that every one of us is worthy, that none can be made less than the greater love that calls us into being, that we do not have to atone for imagined wrongs that others describe to convince us that we are less than sacred. And yet the work remains, right? We do have to find the strength to sing a chorus of welcome and embrace in the face of injustice. We have to offer sanctuary in times of struggle. We have to model a different way. But how do we empower ourselves and our communities to know themselves as holy, to embrace their deeply loved flesh? The Reverend Dr. Towns regularly speaks of a spiritual practice that she calls everydayness. That moment by moment attention to our greatest values as they permeate our living in the world. In an address to Yale Divinity School's opening convocation, she insisted that this is the everydayness of getting up and trying one more time to get our living right. It is in this everydayness that we, the people, are formed, and we, the people of faith, live and must witness to a justice wrapped in a love that abides and a peace that is simply too ornery to give up on us. These days, I am trying to live my theological covenants by embodying just a piece, a measure of that inherent orneriness that never gives up. No matter, how, no matter how tired we may become, let us never give up on the work of justice. Take a break, please. Be humane to yourselves, but come back in community to the work. Right? No matter how others work to shame those beloved among us, including ourselves, May our response be love and ever more love. No matter how we may feel we have failed in times past, let us remember that we have everything we need, as you told us this morning, beloved, everything we need to start again and carry our great open hearts into the world. And through those great hearts, we receive this reminder to love our own flesh Yes, but also to embody that love that lives at the heart of our tradition until it overflows into the community and into the world. Every time that we renew the covenant of our ministry, sometimes most obviously on days like today, when we enter into sacred relationship with a new minister, one who brings their great open heart among us, we are reminded of the moral center, of the joyous witness of our callings in the world. I'm looking at you, my beloved colleagues. I know these days are hard. These days are hard, and yet still, recently I saw a post floating around our UU religious professionals that asked the question, how are we called to do ministry in these times of struggle and heartbreak for so many? One of the many answers really caught my attention. It said that to do ministry in these times is to witness to all that is beloved. It went on as a reminder, people with disabilities, beloved. Transgender kin, beloved. Immigrants, beloved. People living in poverty, beloved. Women, beloved. People of color, beloved. Queer community, beloved. Service members, beloved. Earth itself, beloved. I'm paraphrasing, of course, the list goes on. I would add Palestinians, beloved Israelis, beloved. Horizon Unitarian Universalist Church, beloved. What remains in my mind is all peoples, all families, beloved. Your hearts could populate this list probably three times over given more time. But know that this beautiful encouragement to ministry ended simply with beloved, 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 everywhere, beloved. Lately, it seems that too much public commentary, governmental actions, public speechifying, and more seeks to erase the very beings that we know to be sacred. It is constantly suggested to us in ways that are meant to sneak under our skin, 
that portions of our communities are logically disposable. It is still relatively few, I can say that, relatively few public leaders who are bold enough to use language that blatantly describes us as if we were little more than garbage, but a theme emerging and re-emerging as that language builds and rights and protections are stripped away is that only some of us are worth saving. And every universalist bone in my body knows that is a lie. So this community, with its commitment to welcome, love, grow, and serve, you are providing a vital, vibrant alternative to this growing tide of separation, of loneliness, of exclusion and control that is rising in this nation and around the world. As inheritors of religious teachings that have long been countercultural and longer than long have insisted on leading with love, we need you, I need you, to fully enflesh the possibilities of our inherited tradition. Imagine with me. What if people everywhere knew themselves to be beloved? What if people knew that love made them stronger than the forces of hate? What if nations were called into their best selves by great hearts beating open within their borders? What if communities could empower every heart to greatness? And here, in that dreaming and that imagining lies the root of my profound faith in this shared ministry. You see, between and among you lives the capacity to build on that kind of goodness that has already been in this congregation and to model something greater yet to come. All blessings on this new covenant. Blessings to your partnerships with groups of UUs and others of like minds around you. Blessings on your moral witness, especially here in Northern Texas, to the sacred wholeness and worthiness of all beloveds living among you. Blessings on the joy and fellowship and covenant and community that you gift to one another. Blessings on the work itself. And in all of that, may you enjoy one another. May you have laughter and art and beauty and learning together. And as I learned this weekend, good food. <laughs> may you seek justice and no mercy and return always to the unfettered grace of love. May all the days of your shared ministry be blessed. Reverend Chris, we have your backs. We have your back, singular. <laughs> More importantly, we love you. And in this shared ministry, may you never feel alone. Amen. 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 Could you respond a little better since she's here in person? <laughs> They told me I couldn't do the Baptist version of offering. Musicians, if you'll come on up, you'll have plenty of time. <laughs> um, I understand that they gave you a cheat sheet to help with while you decide how large your offering will be. And it is called the installation offering sheet. It is yellow in your programs. You'll take note of it as you determine where you will make the sacrifice to give largely. <laughs> Hallelujah. Because <laughs> that beloved stuff costs. <laughs> it does. It does. I told my husband that. And he bought it. <laughs> <laughs> 
So don't y'all call him. <laughs> I joined this movement. I'm Reverend Duncan Teague, founder and very proud minister of Abundant Love Unitarian Universalist Congregation in the west end of Atlanta. You will be in Atlanta. You live in a hub. We live in a hub of Delta. You will have to get on Delta at some point. <laughs> and if you find yourself in southwest Atlanta, in the West End, we are right on Ralph David Abernathy. You won't even have to turn off the main drag. And we put up a big sign so they can see us. Amen. Amen. Horizon, I know that you are generous because I have been taken care of like a queen. Don't say it. <laughs> Things have gone so well that Delta decided that I should take a later flight and paid me more than I spent on the trip in the beginning. Hallelujah. <laughs> So I'm going to give you all a little bit back. Oh, I said generous, didn't I? <laughs> I'll make an offering today because uh, I feel blessed. Y'all are so generous that I, musicians, if y'all don't get up here, <laughs> as soon as I finish, they want to hear some music, right? Or is it recorded? He, they're coming, OK. <laughs> Are you shy, baby? Oh, my goodness. They didn't tell you who was doing this, did they? OK. Um, Y'all, the reason I'm here is because I accepted my calling to ministry. And I accepted it in the Unitarian Universalist and not in the National Baptist Missionary Baptist faith. Because there are some people here who will explain to you that I could not have been a minister there. and except without great cost to me and some poor woman that I would have had to marry. <laughs> Notice how I said that. And everybody at the wedding would have been sitting there wondering who's got the dress on <laughs> or the better dress. Phoenix. <laughs> anyway, so I chose to do this within our movement so that I could come here and be exactly who I am and accept my ministry. It looks like y'all call somebody like that. <laughs> I also chose to come and be a part of our movement because all that love that Sophia was talking about, it is expressed not just theoretically, not just when we have ex-Pentecostals come up here and pray by looking at you. <laughs> it is expressed when we get in trouble. And we get in trouble. And some of those people who fell among the thieves. I have some ex-Baptists here. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Y'all can tell them what I'm referencing because they haven't read that parable. <laughs> but we're the Good Samaritans to ourselves through the traditional living tradition fund. Something like that. You know what it is. <laughs> we're also the Good Samaritans to the members of trust. Do you know when you make a decision to transition into the gender for which you feel you were born, we need to get that language right. But the body didn't cooperate, so you had to transition into that which you feel will make you whole. And you don't have to make it gender. Some of y'all had to transition into the artist that would make you whole. You had to look at mama and say, no, I'm not going to be an accountant. And they need financial help because when you decide to transition, guess what happens to your paycheck? What happens to your education? 
what happens to some of our seminaries and our religious educators and our musicians. And they need help, and we are able to help them through the two funds for which you have decided to give money this afternoon. Now, I really want to get Baptist. And I mean give, hallelujah. Anyway, I'm going to be nice. I'm going to be nice. But I want you to also hold in your hearts and minds, because I know there's some liberals and radicals in here going, oh, my God. We are also talking about when you gave that vegan meal and had vegan colleagues dancing a jig around that table yesterday <laughs> evening. And it was good. It was good, even without the pork. Anyway, <laughs> it was good. I'm from Kansas City, y'all forgive me. Uh, just before I go, I want to also come out because I am the grandson of Bethina Shamlin who rest in peace in Bullard, Texas, in the red clay between Jacksonville and Tyler in East Texas. So I got roots, don't mess with me. <laughs> and I got cousins here too. I'm very proud to be a Unitarian Universalist and now I'm proud of some Texas Unitarian Universalists up in North Dallas, how about it? Thank you so much for what you've already given and what you will give that will save a minister who's trying to make it through seminary with children or planning or with an illness that came at the unexpected moment or sometimes those negotiated leaves came a little earlier than we thought and they have to call us and say, can you help me? And your generosity your willingness to see our faith be not just theoretical helps in that way. Is there a basket gonna come around or y'all do it? And if you don't wanna give it in the basket, I understand that you can give it online. <laughs> if you don't wanna give it online, you can do it in all sorts of other ways and I know they'll take your check. <laughs> Thank you so much. Young man, you, it's all yours. gather to install Reverend Chris Rothbauer as the third settled minister of Horizon Unitarian Universalist Church of Carrollton, Texas. Today, we formally recognize and celebrate our shared ministry together. 
both since you arrived and in the coming years. In doing so, we rededicate ourselves to the values of this religious community and the liberal religious tradition of which it is a part. For Unitarian Universalists, the relationship we here recognize lies between congregation and minister. We enter into a covenant, pledging mutual respect and collaboration, openness, and trust. Now, on this day, we formally install you, Reverend Chris Rothbauer, as our minister to live and serve, to learn and love with us. Are you ready and willing to undertake the commitments of this ministry? Well, <laughs> I am. <laughs> Will the members of this church please rise now in body or spirit and read responsibly, responsibly with me the words of, for the act of installation projected on the screen and printed in the insert in your order of service. We cherish our congregation for its historic achievements for those who founded and nurtured it. You read in italics. We celebrate this congregation's call to love dramatically, love boldly, grow spiritually, and serve courageously. This we do because we envision a beloved community filled with compassion, helping all to thrive in a just world. We cherish our congregation and our community. In accordance with the practice of our tradition, we, the members of Horizon Unitarian Universalist Church, do hereby install you, Reverend Chris Rothbauer, as our minister. We would have you dwell among us, speaking your truth to us and listening to your truth. Growing with us in our understanding of love, courage, and leading us in our commitment to the life of principled action. We also acknowledge the call of shared ministry and pledge to you our support and collaboration. Reverend Chris, are you ready and willing? <laughs> I knew I was gonna do that. Ready and willing to enter into the call of shared ministry and, whoa. Are you ready and willing to enter into and continue this ministry with us? I am beside myself. <laughs> I am. With a deep sense of gratitude, trusting in the transformative power of love, and with your continued support, I joyfully take up the ministry into which you have called me. May our time together promote justice, peace, and love so as to show forth the promise of our faith. And let the people say, Amen. Amen. Blessed, Blessed be you. and Namaste. Good afternoon. I've almost got a voice, so. <laughs> Reverend Chris, on behalf of the Ministerial Search Committee, the board, the installation team, and the entire Horizon congregation, we are happy to present you with these gifts. A stole made by Horizon member Andrea Dodds, and a journal in which you can write your dreams, 
and imagine the impossible until it isn't. I'm Evie Sutton. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And I'm John. <laughs> pronouns TBD. Um, on behalf of the families uh, and children and teens of Horizon Unitarian Universalist Church, we wanted to extend a warm welcome to you, Reverend Chris, as our third settled minister. First, the families have made you a card. All the fingerprints of all the children came together. And they've also joined together to contribute a gift. In your honor, the families have made a donation to Horizons Ministerial Discretionary Fund. We see you lead worship and lead classes, but also know there's so much invisible work you do behind the scenes. The families hope that this donation will help you support the many, many people that come to you in need. <laughs> Thank you again and again. Welcome, Reverend Chris. We love you. Aww. Nell Newton, and I bring you greetings from the First Unitarian Universalist Church of San Antonio, Texas. I serve as their assistant minister, and they are so happy to send me up here today. <laughs> they got another one. They got two. Yeah, go, go. We'll be okay without you. Tonight. I'll be back the next week. Reverend Misha and I are here to lead us through an old tradition, an old ritual known as the laying on of hands. And it is as old as the earliest days of the Christian church when it signified a community's commission of an individual to spread the teachings of Rabbi Jesus. It was a physical demonstration of a community's affirmation of support for the person. Now, in our religious tradition, we have returned to this ritual in recognition that ministry can be rough. A little bit. <laughs> but you do not go it alone. There might not be lions, but there will be long days of work and long nights of worry ahead. And all along the way, Reverend Chris will need to know that you have affirmed your support of their work. Now, here's what I love about this ritual. Mm -hmm. It comes pre-queered. <laughs> the laying on of hands does not presume or prefer gender. There are no binary categories that need disrupting, so. Well. Right? OK. Here's another thing that I love about this ritual. It affirms that the person's body and their bodily presence are sacred. Right. This goes beyond all of our pretty little words, and it gets down to the radical celebration of the body in this life, this world. 
That is foundational to our theologies. So now we are updating the ritual to be a little inclusive of folks who can't be here in person, even. So even from a distance, people are going to be able to make a visible, physical affirmation of support. So this ritual is going to be as inclusive as all get out. All right. <laughs> hey again, y'all. <laughs> Reverend Chris knows that, yeah, sure. That. Reverend Chris knows that while they have a particular and important role in this congregation, today's service is about the relationships, the relationships in the congregation and the promises that you have made to one another. It is about the ministry that you are called to do together in these ridiculously, astonishingly, oh my goodness, what have we gotten ourselves into kind of times in our nation and in our world. And you have already begun a relationship in shared ministry with Chris, beloveds, in what has been for the past few years a, a very isolated time. You began again in love. And it is important today that you know in your soul, Horizon you, you that you are not alone. You are not alone. You are not alone in your struggles, in your healing of the past, in your crucial work in the weird present. You are not alone in your visions and your imaginings for the future. You are not alone in grappling with the impacts of a culture of curiarchy that looks for all the world like it's winning sometimes. You are not alone in learning to be in accountable and kind relationships with one another. You are not alone and you never have been. We are in these struggles with you and we are cheering you on just as we need you to cheer all of us on to stay committed to the work of manifesting more love in the world. All right. If you are online, please leave your microphone muted. But I invite you to turn on your camera so that all can see because we want to see you. And then soon I'm gonna ask you to go ahead and place your hand up near the camera. Your hand will be visible to all, to one another, all right? And then if you're so inclined, while your hand is raised to the camera, I'm gonna invite you to try sending a spiral of love through your hand, through your camera, zinging through the wires and pinging off of the satellites all the way to Reverend Chris and the congregation. And for those of us in the building, we will form a collective body, hands upon shoulders, and as we do so, try sending a spiral of love through your hand so that it might travel from one to another, gathering love along the way to place a blessing of love upon this beautiful person. I'd like to invite Chris's beloved family, Calvin and Phoenix, to come up. Chris, why don't you go ahead and all the way to the, not all the way to the edge, I don't want you falling off. <laughs> Pretty soon I'm gonna invite anybody that wants to come up behind, that's fine too. That'll be, that'll be great. And so we have Phoenix and Calvin come up here to symbolically do and be who you already are in real life, the innermost part of this circle of love and support for our beloved Chris. Now, if you're a member of the Board of Trustees and or a member of the Ministerial Search Committee who brought Reverend Chris to Horizon, why don't you all come in next, please? You can come, be the ones to come right up on the stage if you choose to. <clears throat> you, Board and Search Team, are an essential part of the leadership of this congregation and this ministry and are here they are here to bless you today, Chris, as you all bless one another. Now, if you, like me, are one of Chris's colleagues, I'd like to invite us to hold this moment of shared ministry in, a, in especially high honor by doing the opposite of what you might be thinking I'm going to ask of us. Beloved colleagues, 
I believe it is our role today to hold the space and create the container for this minister and this ministry and this congregation. And so in that spirit, I would like to invite all of my ministerial colleagues, ministers, directors of religious education, musicians, administrators, membership professionals, UUA staff, if you are one of those but you are not a part of this congregation, let us all please create a large circle around the perimeter of this room from which we will extend our hands toward Chris and their beloved congregation. You can spread out however you can. <laughs> Spread on out so we've encircled this beautiful congregation and minister with our love. <laughs> Wonderful. And now just in just a moment we will invite the remaining Nope, I'm not stepping on your words. Uh, we will invite the remaining members of this congregation, Horizon Unitarian Universalist Church, forward to lay hands on Chris or on Chris's nearest family members, and then ultimately on each other as the crowd grows. Yep, come on. <laughs> come on. Well, you we said just a minute, but now it is. And simultaneously, we will invite those congregants who are physically present, but who would rather not participate in physical touch, just please join the circle of crowd, the cloud of witnesses around the perimeter. They've already spread out. They made plenty of space for you. So you just can go find a spot. And uh, one of my beautiful, super cool colleagues. And now the rest of you all, neighbors, friends, anybody who just wandered in because you heard about the snacks afterwards. <laughs> This is your church, too, because you are here, and you are loved, and you are welcome, and we invite all of the rest of y'all to join us, either in the No Physical Touch preacher perimeter, or to come forward and be a part of this gathered body of believers in each other, and in Chris, and in the shared ministry of this place. Now, for everyone online, this is your time to hold your hands up your hand up by the camera so that your hand will be seen. Start sending your spirals. Chris, I hope you're looking around this room to see your beloveds who are engaged in this ministry with you. I invite everyone to do that. If seeing isn't available to you, you might simply sense the people around you. Shared ministry invites us to build relationships in new ways from different perspectives. This is Reverend Chris's day, and it is your day too, Horizon UU. And we hope and pray that you can feel how valuable you are in this beloved community. Reverend Chris, today we give physical form to the spiritual truth that we are indeed all connected and that we depend upon one another more than we know. If we have learned anything from these past very hard few years, and I sure hope we have, I hope we have learned more and more every day about our interdependence. We breathe each other's very air, for goodness sakes. Our illusions of separateness have been revealed, and there is no going back. We are in this together, like it or not, and there is no other way. There never has been another way. It's not looking very good for any other way to show up in our future. We're all we've got, beloveds. And you know the best part of that? Is that we are enough. Reverend Chris, you are enough. Horizon, you are enough. And not just barely. You are abundant in love. And it is just radiating out from everywhere here today. Reverend Chris, may you always know that you are enough all by yourself, and may you never, ever, ever have to prove it. May you never forget that a great cloud of witnesses has your back, and you know lots of our phone numbers, so use them. <laughs> Horizon, may you know that while you are strong leaders and supporters of each other, this is also a place for you to rest, to be fed, and to be ministered to. Use it. Reverend Chris and Horizon, may your boundaries and your love lead you to be empathetic, excuse me, to be em emphatic with your nose. I'm going to start that over because I really like this sentence. 
May your boundaries and your love lead you to be emphatic with your no's and enthusiastic with your yeses. May it be so. Amen. Ashe, blessed be. Deep breath. Now it is time for us to all open up the circle and call back our energies as this cloud of witnesses prepares to disperse. May we carry with us the blessing of love that has been shared. May it be so, blessed be. Amen. Ashe. Greetings from Birmingham, Alabama and Tuscaloosa, Alabama. I like to cause some good trouble. <laughs> yeah, and that is not why I have a walker up here. My beautiful surgeon decided I needed to have spine surgery, but that was not gonna prevent me from being here with you today. Chris, my beloved friend, you have honored me with the great honor of delivering the charge to the minister. And for those of you that don't know what that is, I'm pretty much just talking to Reverend Chris right now. So this would be a great time to take a nap, um, especially since I am one of those troubled ministers. I may say some things that make people uncomfortable. So feel free. I want to remind you as you start ministry at this church, just how incredible we all think you are. And what challenges I would offer you and what blessings I know your ministry will be to this congregation. I read all of the instructions. I did all of the research on what this part means to the installation. I debated learning Welsh. <laughs> And surprise, surprise, I decided to go my own way. <laughs> Watching your ministry grow and evolve has been one of the great privileges of being your colleague. I have closely followed your ministry for nearly a decade. And although admittedly my favorite years so far were when we were in close proximity to each other, we will not let that distance alter our love. Your laugh is infectious. Your personality puts people at ease in such a beautiful way. And you are a tremendous minister, friend, and colleague to all who know you. You are beloved by my children. And although we never officially figured out a term for this love, it needs no definition. My children will always ask, will we get to see Chris at the mountain? I've never told you this, but I think one of my initial draws to you is that my brother's name is Chris, and over time you have become a sibling in faith to me. And as a well-practiced bossy sibling, <laughs> Now we move into the charge, the part where I lovingly get to remind you of the path before you. There are folks in the wider UUA who have this misunderstanding that because we live in or serve ministries in the South, that we are somehow less liberal than our Northern counterparts. <laughs> Do y'all think you're less progressive? No. Less dedicated to this faith tradition? No. You and I both know we are just as liberal. And it is the common work that we do in the trenches of where we serve, giving our ministries that extra spice and sense of purpose. But we also know how exhausting it is living and serving and preaching in states that are consciously seeking to damage our people, reversing gains toward justice and resisting any change in the status quo which does not serve those who already have power and influence. You, Reverend Chris, have jumped 
from the frying pan into the fire. But remember, you do not do it alone. You are surrounded by all of these beautiful people and all of those who are to come to do the work with you. Let them help. <laughs> Your job is to support them, not to do the work of justice for them. While also living out your call and representing all of us whenever you have the energy and feel safe to do so. As an overachiever, I pride myself on my hours clocked in professional development. And then I look at your credentials. <laughs> Three master degrees, certified in spiritual direction, about to be dream work, and the newest one I didn't even know about, labyrinth facilitation. <laughs> Danielle, you, you have a... <laughs> so I'm about to say two things which might contradict themselves. You've inspired me that I need to add some more credentials to my life. <laughs> and also, and this is the more important one, know who you are right now is more than enough to lead this congregation in a profound and transformative way. You already have what it takes. You don't need more classes. You know, do what I say, not what I do. <laughs> Take more classes only if they bring you joy because you are already where you need to be. Now, you know you are your best self when you are exploring the world. And when it's 2 a.m., the night before a week of vacation, and you are booking a plane ticket to Turkmenistan, remember for you, Travel is not an escape, but it is an exploration of our interconnected world. And when you do those things, you come back to your congregation a better, healthier, well-rested minister. Set aside part of your professional expenses to travel. Continue your adventures. And if you're willing, share them with us when you return. We want to know what you learned and what inspires you. Your people are another way that you get to explore how the ultimate concern shapes itself in our world. I don't need to tell you how to do this job or how to take care of yourself. You probably have as many courses as I do in figuring that out. But what I will tell you right here, right now, is that this congregation is your present and your near future. Your relationship and your ministry with them are enough. They are your adventure. And Reverend Chris, it is not your job to please everyone. And I would say it is not your job to please anyone other than your fur babies yourself and your darling Calvin and Phoenix. In that order, it is your calling to walk alongside these folks. What? Okay, okay. I'm sorry. I am, I am a well-worshipped cat woman. Like, the, they go first. It is your calling to walk alongside all of these folks, showing them your loving kindness. Everything else is already present between you. Be present, be grateful for your blessings, focus your energy, and most of all, have fun. Congratulations. Good afternoon, again. <laughs> it is so wonderful to be with you here, um, to be with you, Reverend Chris, and 
with this family, Horizon. It is a joyous occasion, um, this installation of your settled minister. Now you have a minister. Yay! Yay. <laughs> so I will do two things. I do bring you greetings from the DFW area. Uh, minister, ministers. Or we have a cluster of ministers uh, as part of the Unitarian Universalist Ministers Association Southwest um, region. And um, there are quite a few of us here, actually. Uh, so we want to express that we are glad that you are here. We, uh, we met in the summer, in August. It was pretty hot. <laughs> but since you landed, I've been already learning a lot from you. I've enjoyed working together with you. Um, I don't know if you had enough time to figure out where's east or west before you were called to some challenging pastoral situations. And um, then um, I also saw that you carry with yourself a conviction that we can do much more together than alone. And we already have collaborated together with our congregations, you and I, and um, Horizon and community uh, in Plano. And we continue to hold hope to, to keep doing things together, to pull our forces together and pull together our compassion and passion for justice and for this North Texas area. Um, even at the two, two weeks ago, the minister's retreat, you uh, impressed us with some of your knowledge about the recent developments in our denomination and guided with us with our, your wisdom. And it, what I've gotten to know you, I've seen your deep roots and connections that you bring with you to this ministry. They've guided you, they've grounded you, and, and what a great joy to have you here to share this ministry with Horizon, to welcome radically, love boldly, grow spiritually, and serve courageously. Please know that your colleagues and fellow congregations are deeply committed to your success. So on behalf of all the ministers, I'm here today to extend you a Hand of Kinship. It is a, a new name for a tradition that has been 400 years old. But it is a tradition that represents all the ministers behind us and all the ministers still ahead of us. And it reminds us that ministry is a shared act. We are a tradition that sometimes agrees and sometimes does not agree but we always are part of one another, and we grow together. This hand of kinship reminds us that we are in covenant with our colleagues in this ministry together. And it is a joy to work together with lay leaders and with ordained leaders, with clergy. We're glad you moved to Texas to do this work together here. So with this hand of kinship come many blessings from your colleagues. Turning point, a fork stuck in the road. Time grabs you by the wrist, directs you where to go. So make the best of this test and don't ask why. It's not a question, but a lesson learned in time. Something unpredictable, but in the end is right. I hope you had the time of your life. Take 
take the photographs and still frames in your mind hang it on a shelf in good health and good time tattoos and memories and dead skin on trial for what it's worth it was worth all the while something unpredictable and the end is right i hope you have the time I'm Reverend Dennis McCarty from the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Columbus, Indiana, otherwise known as Flyover Country. <laughs> and I'm here to do the charge to the congregation. Back when I was a little kid, I just loved the 1950s TV show, The Lone Ranger. Now that was 60 years before it dawned on me that the Lone Ranger was a nice, wholesome example of 1950s style patriarchal white supremacy culture. <laughs> That's a topic for a whole sermon. We don't have the time, but I still think about it now and then. I'll get back to that. Decades later, I began to study for ministry and the first installation I ever attended was at First Unitarian Church, Chicago, and the speaker began a sermon by asking all the professional writers in attendance to raise their hands. And I thought, oh boy, I'm a writer, so I raised my hand. And then he asked all the theologians present to raise their hands. And I thought, well, I'm a theologian in training. I raised my hand again. And he kept naming professions. One after another, teacher, publicity agent, office supervisor, psychologist, sociologist, theatrical director, on and on. And I finally stopped raising my hand. <laughs> and so did everyone else. And that, he said, was precisely the point. No one does all the professions he named. And yet, he said, those are all jobs we expect a minister to do. That's the nature of ministry. Now, I brought along an illustration of all the stuff ministers are supposed to be able to do at a professional level. Unitarian Universalist Association pub uh, publication, Fulfilling the Call, a model for UU ministry in the 21st century. It lists all the different duties and competencies and skills demanded of a minister. I'll just read a little of it for you. It speaks for itself. A list of what a minister is supposed to be able to do. It's on, on fan fold paper. <laughs> a minister is expected to know budgeting, communication, community organizing, conflict management, counseling, decision making, facilitation, fundraising, homiletics, intergenerational relationship building, leadership development, listening, marketing promotion, multicultural competencies, negotiating, networking, pastoral care, problem solving, public speaking, research, 
writing. Uh -huh. Anti-racism, anti-oppression, and multiculturalism, congregation systems theory, contemporary culture, counseling theories, current events, developmental theory, family systems theory, history theory of social movements, literature, organizational development, philosophy, preaching and worship arts, professional ethics, psychology, religious education and theory, roles and responsibilities of a UU minister, scripture story and myth, sexual health, small business management, <laughs> spiritual practices, theology, UU history and polity, world culture and religions. A minister is expected to be <laughs> adventurous, agile, articulate, authentic, aware, balanced, compassionate, competent, confident, courageous, creative, curious, emotionally intelligent, entrepreneurial, generous, a good listener, grateful, honest, humble, humorous, innovative, inspiring, joyful, kind, loving, patient, a person of integrity, playful, politically astute, practical, a risk taker, spiritually mature, strategic, thoughtful, transparent, trustworthy, visionary, and wise. <laughs> now there are two ways a congregation can approach this book. And I suppose some member might read it and then say, Aha, our minister is not doing number 67. <laughs> and some people actually do that. I've met them. But there is a different approach, which is to say, wow, that's a really long list. How can we work together to accomplish all those things and make this a successful congregation with successful ministries. And I leave it to your wisdom as to which churches flourish, the first approach or the second. So my first charge to this congregation is to remember. Remember why you are a congregation together and remember what brought you together with this minister. You may be honeymooning right now, but sooner or later, every honeymoon ends. And when that happens, it's important to be able to remember why you're together. May that why always remain larger than any what that happens to be getting in your way at the moment. Remember your active installation. Those are some good thoughts. And maybe even better, certainly just as good, remember your congregational covenant. Now a covenant is a serious ethical promise willingly entered into by equals. And I've looked at your covenant. I took the liberty and it's a good covenant. So remember your promises. We choose to act with love and forgiveness toward others and toward ourselves. Nice sounding words, but that can be hard work to actually do moment by moment. We promise to be aware and respectful of different cultures and identities. That's an easy one to forget. Sometimes we need to be reminded and that's just fine. More to the point, it's just human. We always have that permission to be human. We promise to come from a place of wanting to understand the other person's perspective. In the heat of the moment, snark can be so much easier than curiosity. Let us try to remember to be curious when we're pissed off. <laughs> That also can be kind of hard to do. We promise to communicate with kindness and actively listen to understand. Actively listen to understand. That's that curiosity piece again. But what happens when we forget to communicate with kindness? I'll get back to that. 
And finally, from your covenant, we promise to accept responsibility for our individual actions. But again, that can be difficult, particularly in the heat of a tense moment. So here's the deal. A covenant is not about being perfect. In fact, a covenant is most important when we're not perfect. When we do forget, when we make a mistake, when we fail to act according to our own best standards. The most important thing about covenantal relationship is what it calls us to do when we've fallen out of covenantal relationship. It's all about do-overs. It's all about stepping back, cooling down, get some distance, forgive others, forgive yourself and rewind all the above promises to get back into relationship. And that's when a covenant really is most beautiful and most powerful. So I charge this congregation to be together in one another's imperfection and limitation because no minister can do it all. There's just too much all to be done for anyone to do it. So we work together to complement one another's imperfections and limitations with our own strengths and talents. Share the beauty, share the humanity, share the ministry. That's pretty powerful too. Now I know Texas is the Lone Star State and that brings me back to my childhood because after all the Lone Ranger started out as a Texas Ranger. I charge everyone here to remember you are not the Lone Ranger. <laughs> Chris is not the Lone Ranger. No one here is the Lone Ranger. That's precisely what this congregation and covenantal relationship are all about so that we don't have to be lone rangers so that we can celebrate and do the good work together. So for lack of better terms, let us be a squad of siblings, a fellowship of seekers, a coterie of the curious, a league of the lively, a band of the beneficent, a hopeful heap of the happy. <laughs> Long may this congregation bring out one another's unique talents and melodies, as it were, helping one another and the world to dance, because we all so badly need to dance toward a future that will be better than the past. Diverse seekers though we may be, I think that is a faith we can all share. So may it be, salam, shalom, blessed be, and amen. I'm Reverend T.J. Fitzgerald, the Minister of Community Care and Engagement from First Unitarian Church of Dallas. Uh, it's been a long day, so luckily my um, chalice extinguishing is only 37 minutes long. I see you haven't changed your clock up here in the pulpit, so I have another hour to go. <clears throat> no. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to extinguish the chalice, I promise. But uh, I'm a queer kid that grew up in Texas. Do not waste this chance. Do you hear me? Yes. Bless you, Chris. Thank you. From the 12 year old who grew up here for coming here. Don't ever make him leave. Okay? I love you all. What we do here is sacred. Who you are, every piece of you, every piece of all of you, is holy. We extinguish this chalice, but the light goes on. 
The horizon is the day that meets the dawn. It is the evening that sets the way to dreams. This is a new horizon. We extinguish the flame, but the horizon shines. If you could please rise in body or spirit and join us in singing Building a New Way, number 1017 in the Teal Hymnal. And the words are projected on the screen. Joel and Kel, Joel and Kel, could you stay on your instruments for just a second? I'm going to ask the band after I give my, my benediction to sing us one more verse of that, back to verse one of that building a new way. My friends, this is our day. Today we made a commitment to building beloved community in North Texas. The path ahead is long, it's winding, and it's uncertain, and I don't know what's gonna happen next week, much less next year. But this I do know. As long as we stay committed to welcome radically, loving boldly, growing spiritually, and serving courageously, our time together will be a fruitful example to the world of how to serve with love at the center. May we remember this day years from now, and may Horizon ever be a place where those who are searching for community find meaning in abundance. Amen, blessed be, and go in peace. <laughs>